For this project, I'll be making Prussian Blue, which was one of the first modern synthetic pigments. It's also sometimes referred to as Berlin Blue or Parisian Blue. Structurally, it's made from a mix of iron in its two oxidation states, iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. The iron 2 plus ion is coordinated with six cyanide groups, and then three of these groups are associated with four iron 3 plus ions. Although it does contain cyanide, it's generally not very toxic because the groups are really tightly bound to the iron. The simplest use for Prussian blue is just as a pigment in things like paint and ink. A more complicated use though is in a process called cyanotyping where it can be used to develop images onto paper. This is how most blueprints were made and it's well why they turned out blue. It can be used to develop almost any image and I think the whole process is really cool. One other potentially surprising use of it is actually as a medicine. It's apparently quite good at sequestering certain heavy metal poisons in the digestive tract and it can prevent a lot of it from getting into the bloodstream. This video is going to be the first in a series of three, and for this one, I'm going to be focusing on making and isolating the pigment. In the next two though, I'll be diving into the whole process of cyanotyping. The most common way to make Prussian blue is to mix a ferrocyanide salt with an iron 3 plus salt like ferric chloride. I wanted to make the ferrocyanide myself, but as far as I know, there isn't really an easy way to do it. So I just ended up buying some from eBay. If you do have what you think is a decent method though, you should definitely let me know in the comments. I can make the ferric chloride though, using hydrochloric acid, steel wool, and hydrogen peroxide. The acid and the steel wool are easy to find at the local hardware store, and the peroxide is just from the pharmacy. To start off, I added 225 mils of water, followed by an equal amount of concentrated hydrochloric acid. I mixed it around for about 30 seconds, and then I added some small pieces of steel wool. In total, I'll be adding 50 grams of it, but I wanted to start it off slowly, just to make sure that the bubbling didn't get out of control. What's happening here is a reaction between the iron in the steel wool and the hydrochloric acid to make iron 2 chloride, also known as ferrous chloride, and hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas is the reason for all the bubbling, and it does pose a fire and explosion risk. Throughout this reaction, a decent amount of it's going to be generated, so it's important to do it in a well-ventilated area where it can't build up. The reaction seemed to be quite well behaved, and it didn't look like it was going to get out of control, so I just dumped in the rest of the steel wall. I time-lapsed it over the next 9 hours with occasional mixing, and most of it disappeared. The green color of the solution was from the ferrous chloride, but as it progressed, it started to become black. As far as I know, this is mostly just carbon, but there are probably some other impurities because steel wool is not a very high grade steel. After the 9 hours, I stopped the time lapse and I just let it sit overnight. By the next day, the carbon and other impurities had sank to the bottom, but there still was some undissolved steel wool floating on the top. In theory, I could have added more acid to dissolve it and stirred it for something like a day, but for the amount that was present here, I just really didn't think it was worth it. The next step was to get rid of all this undissolved junk, and I did this by just passing it through some coffee filters. It did take a while, but I was eventually left with this nice crystal clear solution of iron 2 chloride. This iron 2 chloride was then oxidized to iron 3 chloride using hydrogen peroxide. In theory, it's also possible to oxidize it by just bubbling air through it, but that process as far as I know is kind of slow, and this method is way faster. The moment it was added, this yellowy brown color appeared, which was the iron 3 chloride. In total, I added 550 mils of the 3% peroxide, mixed it around thoroughly, and then poured it into a large dish. I set up a fan off screen, and I let it evaporate for a couple days. Then I started scraping it off the dish, even though it was still a bit wet. It was actually kind of a huge pain, but when I eventually did scrape off everything, I let the loose pieces dry for another day. So in total, this entire drying process took about 3 days, but that's just because I let it air dry. I could have sped it up quite a bit if I put it in my oven. The final yield was 214 grams of iron 3 chloride hexahydrate, meaning that every iron 3 chloride has 6 water molecules associated with it. I transferred it all to a nice plastic container, and I was ready to make the Prussian blue. The first step was to actually remake a solution of the iron 3 chloride. So into this beaker, I added 37 grams, and then I filled it with water to around the 50 mil mark. 
In theory, if I were even lazier than I currently am, I could have just directly used the solution from earlier and skipped the whole evaporation step. The major reason why I didn't do that though was because I didn't know what the exact concentration of iron 3 chloride was and I also wanted to have a proper dry stock of it. Anyway, I let it stir for about 20 minutes, but there was still some solid stuff that didn't dissolve. To get rid of it, I tried to do a gravity filtration, but it was just way too slow. So I instead set it up for a vacuum filtration, which left me with a really nice and dark solution. I dumped it all into a small beaker, and I moved on to making the second solution that I needed. This time, I added 13.9 grams of potassium ferrocyanide, and again filled it up to around the 50 mil mark. I let it stir for a few minutes and it mostly cleared up, but there was still some undissolved stuff, so I shot in some extra water. I let it stir for a bit longer, and when it was crystal clear, I took it off the stir plate. I also took out the stir bar, and at this point, I was ready to make the pigment. I'd normally just directly poured the iron chloride solution into this, but I instead added it dropwise because I thought it would look cool. The moment it was added, it immediately formed some little greenish blue donuts of insoluble Prussian blue. It also made potassium chloride as a side product, but that just dissolved into solution. From the top, each drop kind of looked like I was making little jellyfish, and I found it was kind of amusing. I continued playing with it a bit, but when I eventually got bored, I just poured in the rest. I stirred it for a few minutes, and so much Prussian blue was made that it got quite thick. To separate it off, I just used the coffee filter. I poured and scraped out as much as I could, and then I washed the beaker with a bit of water. When most of the water had filtered through, I added some more just to wash it. Because this reaction used an excess of iron chloride, the first few washings are tainted with this yellow color. I just kept washing it until it was a greenish blue, which I think took 4 rounds. I let it sit here for a few hours, and then I put it on some paper towel to dry. It was important to not let it dry completely though, otherwise it would have just stuck to the paper. While it was still damp, it was really easy to lift off, and I transferred everything to a glass dish. I put it in my oven for several hours, and I was eventually left with some nice and dry Prussian blue. Then, I put it all into my mortar, and I crushed it up as best I could. My final yield of the Prussian blue was 17.7 .7 grams. I really wanted to make some paint with it, but at the moment, the grain size was still a bit too big. It needed to be a really fine powder, so I just put it in my coffee grinder. I ground it intermittently for several minutes, and when I took off the lid, there was some really nice blue dust. I dumped it all out, and it honestly still wasn't as fine as I would have liked it to be, but it was more than good enough. There were a lot of different paint types that I could have made, but I figured the easiest was just oil paint. I went to my local art supply store, and this was everything that I picked up. I got some brushes, watercolor paper, a knife, some gesso, and some linseed oil. Before we get started though, I just want to give a disclaimer and say that I don't really know much about art or oil painting, and everything I learned was just from some random tutorials. What I'm doing here is mostly just for fun, and it really shouldn't be used as a reference. Also, try not to be too harsh on my technique and other stuff. In theory, for oil painting, any paper can be used, but apparently the heavy, acid-free stuff works quite well. Regardless of the paper or surface though, it's a good idea to first treat it with something like gesso, which is basically just a paint primer. To do this, it's actually quite easy. I taped down the piece of paper I wanted to use, and covered it with a generous amount of gesso. When I felt like I had done a decent job, I let it dry for a few minutes. Then on top of it, I quickly gave it a second coating. The paper slowly started to warp though, so when it was dry to the touch, I lifted some of the tape and did my best to press it down. I then left it overnight, took off the tape in the morning, and it was good to go. Off screen, I prepared two other sheets just like this one, for a total of three. Now to make the paint, the pigment just needed to be mixed with a small amount of the linseed oil. This is one of the simplest ways to make it, and a lot of oil paints are just a straight combination of oil and pigment. From what I saw online, there's a whole proper technique to manually mixing the paint, but I figured it was just the easiest to use a mortar and pestle. It seems to work decently well on a small scale, but if you want to make more than just the small amount that I did here, I really don't recommend it. 
I added about 2 grams of the Prussian blue, and then I poured in some linseed oil. I mixed it around and it looked like there wasn't enough oil, so I added some more. Unfortunately though, I added way too much, and I had to balance it out with more pigment. The final consistency of the paint depends a lot on the preference of the artist, and I just stopped when I felt it was thick enough. To get it out of the mortar, I just scooped it out with my finger, and scraped it into a small beaker. I planned to use it all right away, so this was fine, but if I wanted to store it, I would have sealed it in a paint tube. To test my amazing paint, I decided to draw some chemical structures. This was literally the first time that I had ever done any kind of oil painting, so it was kind of a mess. Just for fun, I think in the comments, you guys should try to identify the molecules here. Also, feel free to point out any mistakes that I made, because I almost definitely did. In any case, when I was done, I let it dry for a couple days, and this was the final scanned result. The somewhat success of my first attempt gave me the false confidence that I needed to freestyle something. To be fair, I made it in less than a minute, but it was still extremely disappointing, and it looked like something a two-year-old would make. I clearly didn't have the skills to work without structure, so I knew I had to follow a tutorial for the next one. A friend suggested a butterfly, so I followed a step-by-step -step guide on how to draw one. I ended up quitting halfway through because it started to get way too detailed and hard for me, but it still turned out a lot better than I expected. I moved on to painting it, and this time I diluted some of the paint with a small amount of turpentine. In the previous attempts, it was a bit too thick and I felt like it might be easier if it were thinned out a bit. I left the top portion of the paint undiluted though, so that I could use a mix of both. I originally planned to try to make the butterfly detailed, but I ended up just coloring it all in. When I was done, I let it dry for a couple days, and then I scanned it. Anyway, that's basically how Prussian blue pigment is made, and how it can be used in paint. To make blueprints though, the process is quite different, and in my opinion, really interesting. Instead of making and isolating the pigment, it's formed directly in the paper. It's also a light sensitive process that uses different chemicals. It uses potassium ferrocyanide instead of ferrocyanide and a light sensitive iron compound. Like with this project, I just bought the ferrocyanide, but I made the new iron chemical myself. There really wasn't much info out there though, and I ended up just following some random old paper that I found. Thankfully, to my surprise, it actually worked really well, and that's what I'll be covering in the next video. I really hope to have it up within the next week, so definitely keep an eye out for it. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see my videos at least 24 hours before I post them to YouTube. Also, everyone on Patreon can directly message me, and if you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end like you see here. As one final announcement, my good friend just released his first album. If you're into rap, you should definitely check it out and show him some love. I ain't trying to do what they do. I ain't trying to move how they move. All I'm trying to do is stay true. All I'm trying to do is play cool. I ain't trying to do what they do.